G'day. My name's Tragic and this is a pauper constructed video. This is my first ever attempt at making a video, so I'll be surprised if anyone watches it. Okay, so let's have a let's have a look at this deck. It's obviously a mono black rat deck. Now this deck is based upon a quite a popular deck going around at the moment called Tribal Rats. So it's rats. So we all know what rats are. Rats is all about the discard. This particular variant I'm using I call Rats in the Rafters. That's how I organize my decks if they're famous decks. I have a directory with the deck name, in this case Tribal Rats, and then I have all my individual variants with their own names. Helps me to remember it and I like having fancy names in my decks. Gives it a sense of personalization. Okay, so this guy here is the crux of the deck. This is what the deck is built around the ninja ninja rats now what's some what's good about this card is it uses a keyword called ninjutsu which uh some people might not know basically what ninjutsu does is that any attacking creature can be substituted for this card during the attack as an instant so if you're attacking and they don't block, like say you're attacking with a 1-1 one, one, and they go, oh, one damage, who gives a stuff about that? You can cast for four mana, which is actually cheaper than its uh, raw casting cost. You can cast for four mana the ninjutsu cost and it will replace the attacking creature with this one attacking. So it'd be like, it would turn a ravenous rat's attack into this guy attacking. And it has an ability to discard two cards on player damage, which is quite significant. And as an added bonus, the card that you're attacking with goes back into your hand, doesn't go to the graveyard. So then it can be recast after combat. So that's kind of the, the crux, the trick in this, de in this deck. Uh, ninjutsu attacking this card. A lot of people don't realize this because uh, ninjutsu is actually a fairly rare keyword. Okay, so what else have we got here? Let's start at the beginning. We've got these cutthroats. Now they are very, very obvious cards. Uh, they, they're basically a 2-1 drop. They have fear, so they can only be blocked by black or artifacts. So this card allows us to get damage through to a variety of decks that don't that aren't black or artifact based. Now, obviously they are two one, so they're very weak, but because they have fear, it allows you to get a lot of damage in. This is a card that you would side out if you hit a lot of if you if you met a really strong black deck for some of the cards in the sideboard, which I'll get into later. Though it does serve a purpose, and that purpose is this deck is actually low on damage because rats are so small. It the deck functions by reducing your opponent's casting abilities, so they're actually constantly drawing off the top. You want to empty their hand as quickly as possible with this deck. But this guy doesn't do any of that stuff. So he's, sides, he's so he's able to be sided out, but he does get damage in and he's a two drop. So that's pretty good. Now, Ravenous Rats, I mean, we all know this card, an old classic. It's a one, one, two drop that discards a card. Perfect. Now, Chittering Rats is actually quite interesting. Chittering Rats is very similar to Ravenous Rats, except it's a two, two. Costs three mana, but instead of putting the card into the graveyard, it makes them put a card from their hand onto the top of their deck. Now, this is actually a more powerful effect than Ravenous Rats, in my opinion. Because Ravenous Rats, they put a card in the graveyard, and then they get next turn they get another draw. While Chittering Rats, because it puts it on top of their library, they actually have no draw. It's basically like skipping a draw step for them. So if they have no play and you cast Tutoring Rats, which is the perfect time to cast it, then the next turn they'll have no play. Basically it just slows them up, slows them down. While if you do Ravenous Rats or any other type of discard that goes into the graveyard, the next turn they get a draw which could possibly give them a play that turn. So while Ravenous Rats functions better for the way the deck is designed to run, Tutoring Rats slows down their entire game, which is very, very important. And I'll get to Crypt Rats a bit later. As for special land, we have Quicksand. Quicksand is obvious, it's a colorless mana land. It doesn't come in tapped, which is good. But you can sacrifice it without paying a mana cost, and it will give attacking creatures minus one, minus two, as long as they don't have flying. The reason for this is our rats are very weak. This will drop the opponent's toughnesses by two. The minus one isn't so important, but obviously it has its place. So your quicksand can completely kill creatures, or 
it can drop creatures low enough for our creatures to kill them. So we can now kill toughness 3 and toughness 4 creatures. Obviously it doesn't do flying, but then again, we can't actually kill flying creatures with this deck really, except for our removal, which I'll get into later. And the only other card I have is the bog. Now this bog, when it comes into play, it exiles all the cards in the opponent's graveyard. So it's really just designed for decks that have graveyard play. Now, while it isn't as powerful as, say, a Relic of Prognosis or whatever, I find it's very cool just to have one of these in my deck. Basically, I just use this like a normal land. I don't worry about it for game one. But if in game one I notice he's got graveyard play, then in game two I will save this card for the right moment. But in game one I play it just like a normal land. And now let's get into the spells. We've got Disfigure, which is, you know, we all know what that is. And we've got Graphs of Darkness, which is, we all know what that is. And uh, now we have Corrupt over here, which is a six mana card. Now, I'm not 100% happy with Corrupt. I find it a little bit expensive, and I often side this card out because I just find it, you know, a little bit uh, cumbersome to play. It does have a place in this deck, though. You'll notice that we've also got Tendrils of Corruption which is much cheaper and much easier to pay, and it's instant. So I much prefer this card, and it does give us life back as well. You see, the thing is, this deck is slow, as in it's designed to reduce their ability to cast. But until then, we can't really do much to defend ourselves because we've got these tiny little rats. So often we're working off a life deficit. So Tendrils of Corruption is vital for the way this deck works. It allows us to gain health back. And for the same reason, Corrupt is here. I just find that I can't cast this card when I want to because I don't have the, light, the mana for it. But then again, I never get, actually get, have taken it out of the deck because when I do cast it, it almost always is a game-winning moment. As in, when I do actually get to cast this card, it usually wins the game for me or stops me from losing the game. But... It's one of those cards that I'm very iffy about, and I'm looking for better options. I'm not quite sure, but at the moment, it's a pretty good card. So, I mean, that's the life gain. And uh, another reason we have life gain is because of the one creature that I haven't talked about, which is Crypt Rats. Now, Crypt Rats, I actually had to buy two of these. They are slightly more expensive commons, and they have a very cool ability. This ability can be cast even while they have Summoning Sickness and it allows you to do X damage, doesn't even cost one to activate, so if you have one mana, it'll still do one damage, to every single creature on the board and both players. So it's basically a board wiper, but it also attacks the other player. So if you're in a commanding life position, this is such a powerful card, especially if you've got a Tendrils or a Corrupt in hand that you can play, because then you get your life back. And this allows you to completely wipe the board and do damage, and is absolutely vital. Because, as I said, our deck is based on discard. So, once we have their deck to zero, we want to get rid of all their creatures from the board to allow us to attack with our little dudes. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's the Crypt Rats. Very, very cool card, but a little bit expensive for Pauper. And the last card in our main is Unearth. Now, Unearth has Cycling, but you don't really use Cycling too much. Because what Cycling does is allows you to basically discard this card and draw a new card. But the actual effect of Unearth in this deck is way more powerful than that Cycling ability. And the thing that's cool about Unearth is it allows you to put cards, it's kind of like Disentomb, I suppose, it allows you to put cards directly onto, onto the battlefield or whatever. So it only costs one mana, but you can attack, have your Ravenous Rat killed, and then cast Unearth and get that effect back, basically doubling the effect of Ravenous Rats or whatever. And it works with all the creatures, obviously. And beca because, as I say... This is a discard deck. If you've got Unearth in hand, you can just keep charging because actually killing your cards will help you. So that's a very, very powerful card and vital to the strategy of this deck as well. So out of all our cards, we've got three Corrupts and four Cutthroats. They're our sideboard options. They're the ones we pull out for sideboarding, or the ones I've been pulling out 
and I'm actually looking for a better version of something to replace corrupt completely. And if I could find a better cutthroat, something better than cutthroat, I'd probably use that as well. Okay, let's have a quick look at the sideboard. The sideboard we have Cadaver Imp. Now, Cadaver Imp does a similar thing to One Earth. It pulls things out, except it places it in our hand. The big point about Cadaver Imp, obviously, is that it's a flyer. So it allows us to, if they have some particularly heavy flyers, we can use this to block. Uh, not much more to say about that. We have uh, Assassinate, obvious. I often seem to be citing these in for corrupts. We have Dash Hope. Oh, well, let's, we have we have Duress. Duress is a very obvious card. We know what Duress does, and you use this for bombs. You see a lot of decks in the pauper room, pauper rooms that are have cards that search their library to pull a creature out because there are actually some pretty powerful creatures in pauper. I mean, you think because it's commons they wouldn't, but I mean, there's even Eldrazi, for example. In, in this deck with Annihilator and everything. So you often see people drawing this out, they reveal it, put it in their hand, many of the cards anyway. So if you start seeing that, you can put Duress in and you can hold it, and that will allow you to basically get rid of their bombs. Because most pauper decks that I've run into that have bombs are, rely on that completely to win. So that's what we use Duress for. We also have an interesting card here called Dash Hopes. Now, Dash Hopes is a counterspell for black. I mean, how awesome is that? And it is a little weird, though. It's kind of like a Mana Leak, except unlike Mana Leak, you can pay five life to ignore it, which means it's a lot. I mean, it's a million times worse than what Mana Leak, but I found that most people are unwilling to pay five life if they're around ten. So this is more a late game. Like Mana Leak, you cast at the beginning of the game. But Dash Hopes, you cast towards the end of the game because people are unwilling to pay that five life. And just the way the deck works is you have them drawing off the top. You've got their board cleared with any luck using Crip Rats or your other removals. And you've got them drawing off the top. You can really, really slow them by using Dash Hopes. So I think this is a pretty decent card and this is one of the cards that I seem to be always citing in that I've considered main decking. And finally we have Fester and Goblin. This is another set of cards that I am not 100% on and very well might remove or replace. Uh, the thing about Festering Goblin is that you often find Pinger decks. And Pingers are particularly vicious to this deck as we are full of, you know, two drops and one drops. Uh, two, uh, two and one toughnesses, I mean. So a Pinger deck can really, you know, decks that have Pingers can really affect. By Pinger, I mean uh, a card that can, like, tap or whatever and do one damage or two damage to any given creature on the board. So one of the things that pingers have all in common though is that they usually have a low toughness which means that Festering Goblin is a relatively hard counter to that. So if they have a card that can ping you for one like say you know like say a Pyromancer or a Prodigal Pyromancer whatever I mean they have one toughness. So by sending out an attack with this guy or using him as a defense, you get the ability to ping them back, which can be quite important. So that is basically this deck. Uh, it is, like I said, it's a simple deck. You've probably seen it before. But it's designed to empty their hand and then uh, hit them without them being able to muster a defense. It's not what I would call a, a deck that's worthy of uh, actually going into competitions, but I do find it quite fun and it works pretty well in the casual room and in the tournament room. I'm going to run a few games with it, in uh, two games in casual, two games in tournament practice, and uh, yeah, we'll see 
We'll see how it goes.